episode is gone. Well, of course, now that everyone has smart points, you can just check online. Hey, I have a lot of people. Superman, uh, the Grant Morrison bro, was a uh, nice. Faces, faces. Welcome to At the Table with Destiny Comics. talk about the Firefly series that just dropped too. Oh, oh Serenity. I have, haven't picked it up yet. I haven't either and I've wanted to. Um, a buddy of mine is losing his shit over it. Really? What happened? Yeah, um, the Firefly, mm -hmm. the beloved Firefly that we all love and adore, they, uh, Josh Whedon is dropping a mini series of oh, the, yeah. the events it's After a, Serenity. Yeah, it's a six-part series post-Serenity, so we're talking seven instead of nine. Yeah. Um, oh, the, sure, give us less than what we originally did. Yeah. yeah, the cover is amazing because the cover of the first issue is Serenity flying off at you in perspective, mm -hmm. and behind it is a building of, like, um, one of the uh, planets, one of the bigger planets. Yeah. It has this building, and on the building is a giant sized screen with a picture of Malcolm Reynolds saying, Wanted. Nice. You know, and it's like this giant picture of Malcolm, because mm -hmm. after Serenity, he's bad guy number one. Oh, yeah, we all knew that it wasn't just going to be like, Oh, well, he did this, and now the Alliance isn't going to do shit. No, they're the Alliance. He, they're going to track him down. They, spoiler alert, made the Reavers. <laughs> <laughs> Which that was so good writing. Oh, oh my love god! That. I think, yeah, um, I just for Black Friday I picked it up. Black Friday I've been so busy. I just now started watching it, but I finally got a DVD copy of Firefly. Nice. I've been holding off to buy the Blu-ray because on the Blu-ray is like a ten-year anniversary reunion. Oh yeah, like the like a roundtable for something. with the cast. Yeah. And so, like, I've been waiting for the Blu-ray, but on, on Black Friday it was five bucks. So I was like... Oh, you can't afford it. You, you can't it. avoid it. <laughs> so I finally bought my Firefly, and I'm watching the director's commentary. The the series or the movie Serenity? The series. Okay. Um, I have both now at this point. Nice. Okay. Um, but the, all the commentary with Josh Whedon on the series, instead of him talking about the character development, instead of talking about the... Well, he does. He talks about the rich world and all this kind of stuff that he, he designed... He likes to point out every single flaw and mistake <laughs> they've made in the episodes. <laughs> and it's soul-crushing. Because I've watched the pilot, I don't know, 30, 40 times. I've yeah. watched it more than Star Wars. I have. I, I think Firefly is better than Star Wars. I'm sorry. Send um, your hate mail to... <laughs> Sir Noel. Noel at <laughs> DestinyComics.com Oh my gosh, you gave me a real one. <laughs> yeah, I did. That's my real email. I don't want to see if anyone's listening. <laughs> <laughs> Just get uh, lucky to be that one fan too is like, no, no, Firefly is not better than Star Wars. You, sir, are wrong. I'm wrong. Give For me your address and I will come and beat your butt. <laughs> For having an opinion. I know, um, right? you, know, you know how dangerous it is to have an opinion in a series that is so loved and... Just in our culture alone. And not it's, only that, you can't have an opinion online these days. No, oh, no, no. Yeah. It's trolls will eat oh, you alive, and God. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, he like I've watched, like I said, I've watched Firefly more than I've watched Star Wars at this point. I can respect that. And I the, love Star Wars, but <laughs> yeah, there, there's a moment in the first in the pilot. I've watched this pilot so many times. All of them are in the cabinet at the end, the the flight room, the control mm -hmm. room, whatever. And Malcolm is in the foreground, and Wash and Zoe are in the uh, background. Wash is miming. He's actually not holding the steering wheel. <laughs> He's literally in the pose, holding nothing. <laughs> oh, God, that's awesome. <coughs> and Josh Whedon points it out. <laughs> well, to be fair, they probably told him not to go anywhere. Probably. Well, like, he no says nowhere. why they did it because they had to back him up uh -huh. to fit everyone in frame, and then Malcolm moves, and you can see Wash just miming, just <laughs> miming. <laughs> he's like he's just miming it like he would be. I think. Well, so how sad would you be if that <laughs> yeah. actually 
like was a mistake, and he's just covering up for it. <laughs> so Josh Whedon just he <laughs> points out all these flaws in the series. It's like stop it, stop it. That, that actually could be in character though with Wash. I mean, that's the guy plays with dinosaurs. <laughs> he could just be fake flying machine. Oh, fun. we were quoting that earlier. <laughs> oh, we quote that all the time. Curse your inevitable, but uh, sudden betrayal. Uh, betrayal. Oh my mine is an evil laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, one of my favorite parts. Oh yeah. god. And and what's great about the comic series that's coming up, well the mini series, is that it's what we as fans wanted. Because we all know that an actual series revival right after the movie is impossible. It's been ten years. The actors have physically aged so much that they're not able to play the same characters that they were ten years yeah. ago. Yeah. But this, I mean, people can draw them as they looked back then. The only other option is to do a 10-year series, 10 years after the events of Serenity, and that would just be too rough, I feel. I would prefer if they continued on the movie. I would say, okay, here is, do like Back to the Future 2 or Superman, um, and what I mean by that is film 2 and 3 at the same time. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, they barely had the, the budget for one, didn't they? they? Well, they barely had the budget for one, and the reason why they never made a sequel is that movie made money. Yeah. It did, but the thing is it made the money majority-wise overseas, mm -hmm. not domestically. And so domestic uh, theaters don't look at that as, oh, well, yeah, you made X amount of money, but you didn't really make X amount of money. Yeah. And the thing is... That is the old theaters not moving into the global market. That's what it is. Because for so long, Hollywood set the standard on box office. Mm -hmm. So, why should we care about what these movies are doing in Japan or whatever? And it's it's literally just being ignorant of the marketplace that you're making yeah, films I mean, on. You have to evolve with the times or you die. <laughs> television is at the same place. Yeah. Um, we don't pay for television. And I, I, every time I tell someone this, blows their mind. In America, basic cable is 60 bucks. Basic. In Europe, count, playing with the exchange, for internet, high-speed internet, cable and phone is 30 bucks. What? Yeah. Mind blown. Um, well, I could afford that now. Exactly. And I don't make shit. Um... You know, we could pay for cable, but I won't. It's just like, why would I pay for that when I... These I'm, days, you don't really have to. You don't need... You don't have to. I can pay for internet get all the same content. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And you can't do what I want in terms of cable, which is I want to be able to, you know, pay like, you know, 55 cents or whatever for Discovery Channel, 55 cents for, you, you know, can, National Geographic and whatever, and just pick what I want. What we do is through our Blu-ray player, we have uh, Vudu and this... They're not a paid sponsor, so if you're listening to me... <laughs> but they could be. They could be. Um, just call us. <laughs> uh, we pay for Voodoo because I don't want to just pirate everything on offline. I, do. uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to have to. Well, you don't want to have to. Yeah. So um, we we pay through Voodoo, and we pay per episode of show we watch. Oh. Or I can pay 20 bucks and get a season pass, and as the show comes alive on cable, next episode pops up. We pay for Doctor Who. We yeah. pay for Sherlock. Nice. We pay. We pay for BBC. Yeah, what pretty it, much. What it breaks down. The things on BBC are worth it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, pretty much. If it's going to show up on BBC eight times out of ten, we'll pay for it. Yeah. We'll, we'll pay. Yeah. You know, we paid for um, Red Dwarf. We paid for Luther. I and, love Red know, Dwarf, by the way. <laughs> um, we we pay for the BBC stuff, but I, I'm, you know, I'm paying for what I use. Yeah. And I read an article um, that if television went that route the pay what you use mm -hmm. it would literally put over like a hundred thousand people out of work mm -hmm. because the networks they don't get those kinds of numbers they don't yeah. to make that kind of model work it just doesn't it, it doesn't work with the system the way it is now and you got to think too how many people just leave the tv on in the background and they wouldn't be doing that if they had to pay for everything that they weren't watching yeah yeah you know? Exactly, you know. You know, if if uh, my grandparents go to bed with the TV on, and I never understood that. Casey does too. I I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, just not my. No, I can't. Um, 
I get sidetracked. I was like, ooh, what's on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, for me, it's like, I'm thinking, even if you have the money, it's like, why would you want to pay for all the time you're not I watching know. the TV? Electricity right bills as well. Yeah. Not, not saying, you know, that I, I guess some people are okay with that, but it's like, I'm the kind of cheapskate that I'm like, ooh, I'm not going to want to ha- yeah. spend money for 12 hours or whatever, however long I'm sleeping, whatever, 8 hours, 9 hours of TV that I'm not watching and all that electricity that it's, it's eating up. Plus, you know? I've, I've heard that if you sleep with the TV on, the light actually doesn't promote well sleep for you or something. Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of that. Like, it inhibits REM sleep or yeah, something. Yeah, there's a lot of things. But then again, there's kind of a long list of what, you know, prohibits or inhibits um, REM sleep, so... Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I've heard that one a few times, and also the the you know because it has something to do, I think, with the brightness of the screen or something like that. Affects like something in your brain. Yeah. And different colors are science. <laughs> science, <laughs> Just yeah. Science. science. I I know because there's a whole study on what different colors do to people. Mm-hmm. Like I know that the, one of the main reasons why McDonald's, for instance, is red and yellow is because apparently those colors make people hungry. Or, yeah, that's what I've heard too. Yeah, you know, so it's... Oh, yeah, I, I do... I look at some of those and there's a reason why there are certain color palettes to some of the books we publish. Mm-hmm. You know, the... You want, me to make, you want to make people hungry? I want to make people hungry. <laughs> um, but no, like, I, I look at a lot of those <laughs> kinds zombies of... zombies are making me so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go get some food. You know, but like for the, the some of the colored books, I, I use some palettes. That I look at like, okay, this is supposed to cause this, and this is mm-hmm. supposed to drag your eye here, and it's just, it's design work is what it is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, eight bit, the 8-Bit Pulp logo is bright red, bright yellow. It, it, it's eye-catching. Yeah, it is. You know? Now I want some fries. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, uh, so you, let's talk about writing. Well, um, before we jump into that, um, we were kind of talking over some nerd stuff. And uh, I gotta talk about this because I've been talking about it everywhere. Is it turtles? It, no, I'm not talking about turtles. <laughs> You're talking about that's too too horrible. To that's mention. too close to the. I think you just gave him a nerd brain. Yeah, no, that, that hurts your, too deeply. Your face just died. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you killed a bit of his soul right now. Yeah, they released what Lewis is talking about is they released oh, the image God. of the uh, <clears throat> Michael Bay turtles. Yeah, it was leaked. Air quotes. How do you leak such high def? things like that. Yeah, no. You don't. I remember a few <laughs> years ago back when the Iron Man movie was out and mm-hmm. the suit the photo of the suit got leaked. Yeah. Now this was a real leaked photo because there was a guy in bushes yeah. filming yeah. through a chain link fence. Like in the photo you saw a leaf, you saw part of the chain yeah. link and then through you saw the Iron Man yeah. suit. Some of that the, is a leaked <laughs> photo. Some of the first images I saw for the new suit from Amazing Spider-Man 2 was like grainy and it's like half of his body and I mean that's how you know it's real. Yeah. You don't leak something that's like a, a wallpaper image for a computer. No, so the, the images of the turtles uh, <clears throat> uh, what like bothers shit. me about those is the all the, the they have like samurai armor on them, mm-hmm. and it just looks like shit. It's like if you go back to the you know I have a framed copy of Turtles Number One framed in my office. Every day I sit down to draw, I look at that thing. Every day you worship turtles. I worship <laughs> turtles. I think I can do it too because turtles is one of the greatest in the comics. Guide me, O oh Donatello. Guide me, O oh Donatello. <laughs> Leonardo, please teach me the ways to be a great comic book artist. Well, I'm more <laughs> worshiping Kevin Eastman and, and um, uh, what's his name, Laird. Uh, that's bad of me. Uh, oh, you're a bad fan. I'm a bad fan, but um. You know, I, I look at what they did and what they pulled off because that first book was published with a tax return. You know, it was drawn over uh, like a weekend on kitchen on a kitchen counter. Nice. And it's 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 still one of the you know they sell for you know hundreds of thousands of dollars these original prints of Trolls Number One because they didn't have they did it such a limited print run. And so I look at these, you know, Trolls. I think my God, it's a billion dollar industry, and it started. With two guys doing an indie comic. Mm-hmm. No color, too. No color, black and white. All the turtles look the same. <laughs> they do. Um, in fact, the, the personalities weren't formally, you know, completely formed in those early yeah. issues. So you didn't really know who was telling except by what weapon they were holding. Yeah. And because they didn't have the initials on the belt buckle no, either. Didn't. Um, and the original cover art had them all wearing red masks. Yeah. 
So early turtles, even when they went to color, all had red. They're all Raphael. <laughs> They're all Raphael. And a lot they of all them, have attitude problems. Yeah. <laughs> they all did. Like Leonardo's, you know, I have some of those early ones where he's cutting people up and doing some mean stuff. And and Michelangelo is even like cursing and stuff mm. like that. So they don't, wow. they, you know, early turtles was adult. Yeah. It was adult content. Bleep and bleep it bleep. And you can see a tad bit of that adult content in the first movie, and I love that about it. Oh my ah. god, when I was ten years old in that first movie, it, Raphael has a scene where he goes out at night and he's standing on the roof of the farm and he just yells out, Damn it! Oh my god. And <laughs> I like as a kid, not only was I was I being introduced to profanity. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, formative years. In formative years. But that was the <laughs> most dramatic thing I've ever seen right? in my life. When they come into the um, the their lair and they see that it's been thrashed, and Raphael just freaks out and he screams, oh, "I get chills! I'm not even kidding!" Oh, it affects me on a deep and profound <laughs> level. Yeah, you know, I love that movie. I think because that <sighs> movie took the dark comic. And then because the 80s cartoon had come out at that time. Yeah. And so everyone knew it from the 80s com, uh, cartoon. And they took the, the Wolfman something cartoon, because that's the name of the producer. But they took that 80s comedy and overlaid the the dark. It was a great, great you know, gritty adaptation. Stuff. And, and, you know, I've said it before, Turtles works better as a kid's property, because as a kid's property, it's a billion dollar oh, yeah, of course. entity. Of course. As that dark, gritty black and white adult comic we all hold it near and dear but it, it minimizes the audience it does it, it does it's the same as difference between a rated r film and a pg-13 film exactly and it uh, but what the new michael bay turtles movie with freaking what's her name is april o'neill the new lens flare shit fest yeah um i still hate her because in my mind she ruined jonah hex megan fox oh yeah Oh, I do not like her. Uh, she was such a bad cast for Jonah Hex. I love Jonah Hex. I love I, that character. I thought Josh Brolin did a, a pretty decent job with it. He did. He, I mean, there was some stuff that could have been improved, but, I mean, it's Jonah Hex. It, it's hard to do that perfectly because it's such an iconic thing. When I saw the first images, I thought, oh, that's really good, but they're going to digitally make his eye bigger, right? That's what I, yeah. Well, like, I thought they're going to go in and play with his eye, make that eye more pronounced because mm -hmm. and i'm watching the comic-con panel online and every other question is about megan fox and fans going can i hug you megan fox i'm like i'm screaming like ask him about the eye ask him <laughs> about the eye you know on my laptop but i'm still angry about well see that's the only problem i really have as far as some of these more well-known considered hot actresses who play these guys. Not that I'm against them personally as actresses, just that people are going to be so focused on them, the hot actress, mm -hmm. and not asking mm -hmm. questions that I, as a geek or fan, want to know, you yeah. know? Oh my so. god, um, I, I don't know if you guys know about the Young Turks. Um, mm -hmm. Fairly political group online, news organization. But the guy before he started that worked at like MB MS, one of the bigger news. MSNBC. Yeah, so... He's interviewing the actress who played um, uh, Mystique on the X Men films, the first one. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. I can't remember. Rebecca Romaine Stamos. R Rebecca well, Romaine. She's not Stamos. Whatever. Yeah. And he asked her, "So what's it like? Are you nervous playing a character who was one of the first bisexual characters in comics?" He asked her that. She freaked out and kicked him out of the interview. <laughs> like, how do you not know your character? Like, how do you not research that? That's what wow. happens when you just hand a role to someone who's pretty. Yes. And, I, and that's me saying that, not knowing anything about Rebecca, Rebecca Romaine's comic book knowledge. But, I mean, you should know that. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like, for me, I, I, I've talked about this before, where it's like, you can be good-looking at a nerd. You can't. Yeah, it's, it's not possible. impossible, you know. The, but the unicorn effect is not as rare as everybody thinks it is. Yeah, I know. It's the, there are some great-looking yeah. men and women out there who are geeks and nerds. But the problem is, unfortunately, in the movie industry, the role almost always goes to the hot actress or hot actor who knows nothing about the character they're playing. It's just like, oh, well, it's going to be a big-budget movie, and, you know, it's going to be, you know, this, that, and the other thing, and, you know, but they really don't know anything about their history, and 
you know, that's why I get mad when I, you know, see, you know, like, people who, at conventions, who are just there to look slutty, or just yeah. there to look, you know, good. You know what, some of those, some of those, if, if, the difference between that for me is the booth paid versus the cosplayer. Well, yeah. see, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, the that, booth paid, the woman that's what I'm talking about. to be there. That's what I'm talking about, the I'm booth friends paid. with a couple of them. That's they what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. It's like, I mean, if you're there at the con and you're a cosplayer, that's different. That's yeah. totally whatever. But, I mean, if you're hot and you're a cosplayer, that's awesome. But the fact that, like the booth babies, like you are saying, they're that's just there hard. for eye candy. And they have no idea what they're doing. Buy our stuff because boobs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Zenoscope, who was with Devil's Do Publishing way, way back. I used to be friends with the guy who, who I, I was so close to getting with Devil's Due Publishing. Hmm. And they're still kind of around. They just do one or two books a year now. Um, but they did, uh, back in the day, they did the original um, Grimm's Fairy Tales books. Nice. And they had the sexy covers, the Michael Turner. I don't, yeah. They weren't Michael Turner, but it was those really scantily clad covers of, like, Little Red Riding Hood. In or, back-breaking poses. Yes. <laughs> They hired models to dress up like those characters, the, the fairy tales, to be the booth babes at the table. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just sitting there watching the traffic, and I'm also watching no one buying the books. Yeah. That's, that's, it's like, wow. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, it's just, that's what kills me at conventions. You can tell the actual cosplayers, mm -hmm. who just happen to be hot, from the ones who are, are there hired. You know, you can, you can totally tell the One difference. One of my first conventions... Um, there was this, this, what I thought was a cosplayer, and she's standing there, and she's in this uh, gold dress, and, you know, got some makeup on, painted purple. I'm like, hey, can I have a photo with you? And, you know, I, I took a photo, a friend of mine took a photo with me and this girl on my cell phone, and after the photo, she goes, well, that'll be a dollar. <laughs> I'm like, er, what? I thought you were a cosplayer. And she goes, no, I'm such and such from such. I've never heard of this woman. Ever. <laughs> I was like, well, I'll tell you what. We will delete that photo off my phone right now because this is mistaken. Yeah. You know, I'm not about to pay you. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Certainly not after the fact. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you should really mention that before someone just takes a picture. You know. You know so that, that yeah. Um, but anyway, back to Turtles. They released the designs of the new turtles. Their faces, oh my god. The faces look weird. They have pronounced nostrils. Mm -hmm. um, they I, I will say, they do look sort of Snappin' Turtle-esque. Yeah. Which <laughs> the other, which the first series of movies didn't really do. They were more humanized, but I liked that better. <laughs> yeah. So, are they changing it to Teenage Mutant and Snappin' Turtles? Snappin' yes. Turtles. Um, I, I don't, I don't like the, the look of the turtles. Yeah. I don't. Um, it, it is more alien, but in the sense that it's like uh, separation is what it is. It's the uncanny valley effect, I think, is what it is. Yeah, it's not quite real, but real, and, and so I'm it's, I'm I'll I'll see it because I'm a huge Turtles fan. They got my money. Um, damn you, Michael Bay! They got my money. I had no desire to see Transformers. I ended up seeing that in theaters because I had to take some kids to see, see it. Everybody loves to hate on Transformers, but I actually like it. I defend the series because you don't go to see a movie about giant fucking robots because you want to be impressed with the massive storytelling and the and the wonderful acting. It has Shia LaBeouf in it. He's a funny actor. He does funny things. Megan Fox is just Megan Fox and that's fine. <laughs> We're talking about a movie about giant robots. It's not you know, Citizen Kane. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll give it that. In, in, and, and for being a movie about giant robots, it is a feast for the eyes. It, That's why I watch it, and I it, love it. My problem that. with... I have no problem with Transformers number one. I have a lot of problems with Transformers number two. Well, yeah, there were a whole crap ton of things wrong just with that from, movie. Just from a story perspective of mm -hmm. killing Megatron and then having his death be meaningless. Yeah. Like, that... I have problems with that story because... Guess what? Megatron did get killed in the first Star Wars or Transformers movie, yeah. and that death went on to have profound effect with Hot Rod becoming Rodimus Prime, and mm -hmm. you know, and stuff like that. So, like, there was character development that was created out of his death. And the death of Optimus Prime is painful, not because it's meaningful, but because they, they just they spit on him is what it is. Like they didn't have the guts to pull the trigger. No, they they killed him. 
They killed him brutally. Yeah. And then brought him back. They didn't have the guts to pull the trigger. And that's what hurts that film the most. From a story perspective. Um, and I'm a Michael Bay proponent. I like Michael Bay. He does what he does pretty well. He does. Um, with the exception of speaking to public. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, poor Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Not a public speaker, that one. <laughs> that was painful. That was brutal to watch. <laughs> that was. That was Optimus getting basically raped all over again. <laughs> um, so, you know, they got my money for Turtles. But what I've been wanting to talk about, and I bring this up to every nerd I talk about, is I saw the trailer for it. Um, there's a documentary called Legends of the Night. Oh, so good. Um, it is... A true document. Well, all documentaries are true. Um, <laughs> this, this one's not really one of them true. Fake documentaries. This, is, this ain't Spinal Tap. <laughs> <laughs> For you young kids out there. In fact, that was the original title. This isn't Spinal Tap. This isn't Spinal Tap. <laughs> um, but Legends of the Dark Knight. Uh, it's you have people who are born with um, um, uh, problems or maladies, people missing legs, and even kids fighting cancer, which is the one that I have problems with who found strength of character through Batman. Nice. And it's these kids and people like, oh, well, I'm, you know, Batman gets me through my day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and as a comic book writer, like, I saw this, this four-minute trailer and it broke me. I'm talking bully stole my lunch money, snot bubble kind of crying. Oh, and I'm God. just bawling. And my wife looks at me and goes, what's wrong with you? I'm like, that man! <laughs> I'm sort of thinking, wow, maybe he did get his lunch money stolen. I don't know. When it's the crying mono-word explanation, <laughs> that's when it's deep. Batman! <laughs> but, yeah, I thought... <laughs> now you're sort of making me sound like a monster. <laughs> what's wrong with you? Stop crying. No, but I saw the trailer, too. Do you too. want me to put on Batman? <laughs> I'll get you some ice cream and put on some Batman. <laughs> now here's your blanket. <laughs> no, but I I uh, saw the trailer too, and it was very touching. You know, it was definitely something that because uh, what they're doing is um at the end of it, this guy was like, "If you want a viewing at a theater near you," kind of thing. They're trying to get viewings, and we're trying to set one up at the local comic book store. Nice. I told them even if we can't get a like them to come down and do a viewing. I will buy the DVD. We will do a viewing. I will pay for it out of my pocket. They've got a nice TV there. Yeah, they, well, not, they project them on the oh, side yeah, of the and building. The, and the, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, I definitely think it's worth doing because mm -hmm. it's such a good idea, you know, and to do this documentary about these people who, you know, are, like Brennan said, some of them are battling life-threatening diseases. Some of them are just, you know, either physically or emotionally not whole mm -hmm. in one way or the other, you know, and... You know, the idea, the fact that there's this character out there who gives them the strength to pull through whatever it is they're going through at the time, you know, and that in itself is very, a very powerful thing, I think, you know, to oh, yeah. be able to, I mean, unfortunately, it's what can I say, to people who don't really get into reading or really get into movies, whatever, they don't understand how strong yeah. an emotional bond you can get to certain characters, whether you're going by the comic book, whether you're going by the novel, whether you're going I by the I cry whatever. like a little baby at Iron Giant <laughs> because it plays off of Superman. It, it doesn't does, even, yeah, yeah. it's not even a Superman movie, but because of that, like, my connection to Superman yeah. and yeah. what that character does for me oh, and I seeing know. this character being, you know, I ball like a little baby. And I, I just, ball every yeah. time I read the death of Superman, honestly. Oh, it's so good. It's such... We uh, were talking about <laughs> Steel earlier today. Steel. Yeah. And the Shaq movie. <laughs> I, I, I've said it several times. I will go to my deathbed not knowing why they didn't put the S on the chest. You don't even have to address mm -hmm. the death of Superman. You can show the comic book. Yeah. It's a Warner Brothers film. They own the character. You don't even have to address that, oh, we're dealing with the death of Superman. Mm -hmm. But why they didn't put the S on that chest of, of Shaquille O'Neal, I'll never know. I used to have a toy of steel, actually. And he it was the toy where you could like bend the legs and he would swing his hammer. It was <laughs> awesome. I, I think I so have that cool. in the office. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. 
I think I have it in the tub in the office. Awesome. <laughs> Lewis is like, let's go look at it. <laughs> let's go and pause the podcast. <laughs> My childhood is bad. <laughs> Steel will save Steel. me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it just that that bothers me. I'll never know why they did that. And um, but to see Batman have a profound real world effect. Yeah. To end this a little bit, the the end of the trailer is um, this guy interviewing this kid, and he goes, what do you think Batman would do if he had cancer? Which they never addressed in the comics. They did the cancer story with Superman with um, All-Star Superman, but they've never done any cancer thing with Batman. And this kid looks right at at the, the, the reviewer, the questioner, and goes, he would stand up like me. And it just broke me. It's just like this kid, like, well, of course he would stand up. Like, you know. Yeah. And I, he would be doing what I'm doing because, you know, I got that figured out and Batman would be with me. And it's just incredible, like, you know, to hear a kid say that. It's, yeah. you know, just like I said before, it just makes a powerful impact on everybody who mm. enjoys him as a character. And, you know, regardless of what you think of every story, every issue... He's just that big of a character that, you know, people look to him. You know, he's not even a real character, but he's real to these people, you know, which yeah. is amazing. And, you know, I, 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 I care about these characters way too much. I, I admit it. I, I spend so much time thinking about, well, what would happen if this or what, you know, like the pocket universe or, uh, you know. I think we all have that. Like, we all have those characters that were like... This is such an amazing character, and oh, yeah. you know we just look up to certain <laughs> characters, even if we don't want to admit it. You know yeah. we have those characters, like um, for instance, uh, I I grew up reading the Harry Potter books. You know when the, the first one came out when I was about twelve. You know, so it was I was right along those, that age. You know, of, was about you know, twelve or thirteen too, or something like that. Yeah, so uh, so I kind of grew up with the character, you, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, I remember feeling so horribly upset when the sixth book came out and Dumbledore died, Yeah, and I'm just sitting there like, you know, people are looking like, okay, man, you don't have to be that upset, and I'm like, no, and so that Simpsons episode, I don't know if anyone's ever seen it, uh, when, Simpsons like, touched on the so yeah, they did a parody <laughs> of Harry Potter, like, where Homer is reading the Harry Potter books to Lisa, yeah. and, you know, they get to the Dumbledore dying bit, and he's then you see him at Moe's Tavern, like, no one should outlive their favorite fictional wizard. Uh, he's drinking. But what's great about that is he he gets to the, the part of the book, and he just starts making shit up so Lisa doesn't have to... Oh, my God. Uh, like, yeah. Yeah. So Lisa doesn't have to know that Dumbledore, the Dumbledore character oh, dies. Oh, I didn't see this episode. Oh, my God. This it's, is so amazing. It's hilarious. And so just the fact that he's, you know... There at Moe's Tavern, <laughs> crying over the death of this guy, and I remember watching the episode, not laughing as much because I'm like, yeah, no well, one should no outlive. Out <laughs> I totally agree with wizard. you, Homer Simpson. <laughs> no one should outlive Dumbledore. Okay, uh, <laughs> you know, it's God. it's pro- it's a great episode. So yeah, yeah, I mean, we all have those characters that were just like, if they die, we're heartbroken, and if you know they live, like yes, you know they made it through whatever the hardship was, yeah. you know. You know, but, like, finding strength in fictional characters, I think that is, you know, like, I get that, you know. Batman is, for a long time, was everything to me. And and these characters still mean a lot to me, even though I'm a grown man. It's like, no, like, I I will, I'll get into fist fights over these characters. I really will. Um, Because of how much they mean to me personally. And to see a kid relate to it and find strength within that is just amazing. Um, so right here I'm probably going to put an ad, you know, to separate things out. And then we'll jump in with, um, writing, because we're a little past the 30 minute, right, come on. <coughs> so, um, alright, writing books, all the fun stuff. Writing Yay. books, words and things. Words, words and, things. and stories and stuff. Yeah, just like in real life, I've been procrastinating on the topic of talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, certain <laughs> things are more fun to talk about. <laughs> yeah. um, my next uh, story for the pulp, uh, other than the serialized one I'm doing, is just going to be titled um, Writer's Block. 
<laughs> you know, we all can agree. Just writers, yeah. We understand. Writer's block. Um, so what's it about? It, what's writer's block about? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, when I tell, when I figure that out, I'll tell you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, how do you guys deal with that? I read, I have to step back from what I'm doing until something fresh comes into my mind. I read, um, I watch TV, not because it's TV, but because it's inspirational to me. Mm. Um, I'm constantly getting new ideas about random things. If I have a, a dream that affects me in a certain way, it will usually change how I'm writing things. So that's, that's usually helpful for me. Um, I just, I usually just have to take a step back or work on something else while whatever it is I was working on just kind of festers. And once it's done festering, I can keep writing it. <laughs> um, for me, it depends on what it is. Um, for instance, I'm not completely sure where I want to go with a story in, uh, the next pulp. Mm. Like, I kind of have some ideas and I'm not sure. So if we're talking about having trouble getting started... Um, there are usually two things that I do. Either I, A, ignore and procrastinate, <laughs> or if I really, like, I have to sit down and write it, then I sit down and just think of things that, you know, I've been through, things that I've done, you know, things, stories I've heard. Maybe I heard a funny story, and maybe that will give me an inspiration to write about something. So, you know, it really depends. Um, if it's a story I'm working on, and I just can't get past a certain point, you know, for instance, I'm writing a novel right now. Um, it's all about this guy who, um, his life, how his life changes over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. And it's first person point of view from the guy. So there are times when I get blocked because, you know, I'm a, I'm a woman. <laughs> so you it's don't like, have the dangly bits. I don't, yeah, dangly I don't have the dangly bits. bits to understand what he would be thinking at this point, you know. And so, you really need the dangly bits to understand the you thought do. process. You do, so it's like... Yeah, see, I don't have the shelf bits, so I don't get <laughs> women, really. The <laughs> shelf bits, nice. Never heard that term before. <laughs> but, you know, like it, so if, if I get stuck in this book, in this novel, um, quite often what I'll do is, you know, if I'm just sitting there and I can't get through this part, I'll go to the next part. Like, if I know where I want to go, if I know kind of what I want to do, I'll jump to the next part and then at that point, it's kind of like a puzzle. Like, how do I fit these two pieces together? You know, it's kind of like, how do I interlock, interlock this piece to this piece? And that's kind of how it helps me, you know, work through the writer's block. Is trying, is just jumping ahead maybe a scene or two or wherever, and then at that point, connecting the dots between the two parts. You mm -hmm. know, and sometimes that helps, you know. And that's actually part of how I write, um, even if I'm not doing, if, even if I'm not involved in writer's block right now. Like, I'll have certain scenes in my head. And Liar. The, <laughs> and, the, and the bridging of those scenes helps to stretch your literary legs. You can write about things that you don't normally write about um, to kind of make the story pop, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think sometimes that helps with writer's block, at least on my point, is writing about things I'm either not used to writing about or not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. For the first three pulps, I did a detective story, and I'd never written a detective story in my life before. So it was all about me trying to figure out how does one go about writing these detective stories. And, and you know what? The I have a hard time because I'm I have the flat foot McGee character noir. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time with those stories too because as a kid you grow up. Oh, it's so easy because you grow up week in week out watching Scooby Doo. You go yeah. you watch these these you know okay this is the red herring so it's mm -hmm. got you know this. But to write that is one yeah. of the most yeah. difficult things ever. That's why I've got so much respect. Like if I let's say I'm watching a show, like for instance, when I was you know growing up, I was obsessed with Murder Hero. Like I was obsessed with that show, and I remember thinking, how do they you know come up with these murders every week? You yeah, know, kind yeah. of thing. Like it's really hard to have these characters have the murder happen. And then, okay, you're going through the process with the main character, whoever yeah, that is, yeah. you know. Whether it be, you know, in my case it was Jessica Fletcher, and, you know, other people, it was other people, you know. But how do, you know, so you, you get to go through the process with that character. Mm -hmm. And you, you know somehow in the end that person will figure out who did it. And then at the end when it, you, they do the sum up. Then you're like, oh, so obvious. Okay, yeah, so yeah. so obvious. Okay, of that course. Key, you know, the whole key to this whole thing was that the light was turned on here. Oh, yeah. okay, I get it. But like Brandon said, to write it, 
yeah. to set up all the plot points when and where you need oh, to. Man, Agatha so, Christie, when I was younger, <laughs> so I, I never cared for Agatha Christie. Now that I'm older, it's like, how did she do it? Yeah, I know, just, right? I'm like, yeah. how did she do it? Oh, dude, God bless the USA Network, because Law & Order, <laughs> SVU, and NCIS are two oh, of my favorite shows. Yes, I love NCIS. Oh, I just, just figuring out how character A ended up murdering character yeah, B is, oh, God, it's so yeah. tricky. And I love it because it's not always just the jealous husband, yeah, you know? No, it's, no. Not, it's not always a crazy ex-girlfriend, you know? There are, they do all these fully formed characters that, to the point where by the end of it you're, you're looking at the killer and like jerk move yeah. <laughs> you know kind of thing yeah. but I get it I kind of get yeah. why you did it <laughs> you know I kind of get why you killed that old lady upstairs you know kind of thing I would have killed her too okay. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> yeah. I would have killed her too but still she was an old lady you know that's actually one of uh, the novel I'm working on I would have killed her too I would have killed her too um, oh is that the title of your you know of your new book coming out? <laughs> no, I, well, the, I have a novel I've kind of played with for years called Neighbors. And, you know, because I've had <coughs> some really interesting experiences with my neighbors. Um, not necessarily here, but in the past. And I just have the idea of two neighbors getting into the war to the point to where it ends with them having, you know, being arrested and <laughs> going to blows, you know. And, but, like, that... I've been festering on this story for years because I've lived through some of it. Yeah. And it's like, it, the structure, just the bare bone structure of the story is hard to figure out. Yeah. I've heard that certain writers in the process of writing detective stories will work backwards. It, like, they'll start with um, character A killing character B, and then they'll work backwards to try to figure out how these circumstances all fit together. Mm. That because makes sense. when you read a detective novel, you're reading the discoveries in the chronological the chronological order that the detectives figure them out. Like, yeah. they'll find a piece of evidence that leads to one, and then two, and then three, and then, oh, they killed so-and-so. And supposedly, if you start backwards, you can just kind of string them together, and you know how they fit because you know the way that it actually happened. But the detectives figure things out in a way that is very interesting because it's more or less backwards, you know? Mm-hmm. So that, I could totally see how that would work, you know? And like I said, it's just... Uh, for me, it's so hard to actually do that. Even after hearing that, it's like, oh, just okay. Now I got to figure out, you yeah. know, <laughs> why this guy killed this girl, and you know, okay, work back, work back. Oh, snag, <laughs> you know. Kind you of know, thing. and it's not just red herrings. You, you, there's so many different things. You, but we grew up in such an era where Saturday morning you get that Scooby Doo cartoon mm-hmm. every, you know, you were given a mystery yeah. every weekend, week out. I mean. And we're spoiled because we live in a generation where stories like that are just given to us mm-hmm. through television, through, you know. Yeah, the generation before that had radio, and I, I listened to a lot of radio plays, and some of those are really incredibly mm-hmm. geniusly written. Some of them not so much. <laughs> but just like any medium, you're going to have the good, you're going to have the bad. And Take them both and there you have the facts of life. The facts of life. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that was not a setup. That was not <laughs> sponsor. <laughs> we are not sponsored by the show. <laughs> uh, as the show that went off the air like uh, forever ago, thirty yeah. years ago. We should have a list of just fake sponsors. <laughs> know, right. TV Land, <laughs> <laughs> Boomerang, <laughs> and USA Network. Hanna Barbera. Hanna Barbera. I love. Well, I love animation. So, but um, oh, not even that. Just make. Crap up like we are supported yeah. by the Flintstone Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Me cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, but I mean, just as as a writer, like um, I know as an artist, I have the tricks to get through a story. Um, I sit in my office. I listen to podcasts all day because I'm just hearing these stories about. You know, I, I sit at that table. I listen to other artists and writers talk about their medium, the, the the job that they love, helps me keep my mojo going. So it's like, yeah. I, this is why I love comics. Yeah. So I can sit here <laughs> and draw this stupid payphone in the background. <laughs> you know, because no one ever looks at that payphone in the background. That I've been working on for half an but hour. that's the job. That's the job. Having the stupid the, perspective. The perspective and background and, and, and anatomy and all that crap. Um... But as a writer, I can't listen to that kind of stuff because when I'm sitting there, you know, 
if I listen to NPR or something like that, um, I get stuck down the rabbit hole of listening and not thinking and yeah. not concentrating yeah. and not. I've I've tried that. I've tried to do the dishes while listening to the Naked Scientists or Hardcore History, and I just stop what I'm doing because it's so fascinating to me. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> Sorry, I just I just had to throw that out there. And it was Felicia Day that turned me on to those two podcasts, actually. Uh, hey, true believers! Sorry to break in on this podcast, but um, we got to you know put some ads in here. Yeah? Um, I'm sitting here with Lewis, who uh, we're the creators. He's a writer. I'm the artist of the Last Templar and March. Probably um, uh, early March. Um, I don't have a tentative date yet, but we're going to be doing a Kickstarter for The Last Templar, our graphic novel. Woohoo! That's right. Tell the kids at home what, what, what it's about. The Last Templar is a story about a Templar knight who is a literal holy warrior for God who gets thrown into the future through unknown circumstances and kind of sort of wrecks house. <laughs> My tagline is, it's like Samurai Jack if Samurai Jack was an asshole. Yeah, I like that. That's very appropriate. <laughs> so, uh, kids, uh, please stay tuned to the podcast. Well, you're probably going to stay tuned to the podcast. <laughs> but uh, check out the Kickstarter. Um, check out the webpage, DestinyComics, with an X, dot com. Because we're gritty and edgy. <laughs> we're gritty and edgy, and someone else got my URL. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, take care, and uh, keep listening. Oh, Felicia Day. Oh. Uh, we just we She's just awesome. finished yeah. season eight of Supernatural. Oh, and God. I love when she appears yeah. in Supernatural because it's really awesome. She makes things interesting. I, I love. Uh, I don't know if anyone has seen up this far the episode where she was uh, the queen of the uh, LARPing community. The LARP episode. <laughs> yeah. I'm, a, I'm a professional sword fighter, so LARP is something I have issues with because I I the ste- I do live steel. I get LARP thrown at me all the time. It's like, this isn't foam. This is a real sword. <laughs> this will kill you. This, I could bludgeon you to death with this freaking sword. <laughs> you know? It might not be sharp, but it is pointy, and I can still... <laughs> you stick the pointy into the other person. <laughs> so I, I have problems with LARP, but that episode was so well done. It was like, yeah, I've been there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that is a little close to home. Oh, my God. But, yeah, I, I love... Felicia Day when she guest stars, and I just want to say I also love her in, of course, Doctor Horrible sing along. Oh yeah, that was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I, <laughs> we worship the House of Josh Wheaton. Here. Oh, we There's do. A, mm-hmm. we, if we were into House Gods, he'd be one of our House Gods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We just watched uh, his Much to Do About Nothing. Oh, I, I haven't seen that so one yet, amazing. but I have it to watch. So. Oh, it yeah. is it is really good, worth watching. Um. And some of the best, I've seen several versions. I've seen the show live, you know. Probably my favorite version. We have a, a, a bumper sticker on our trash can saying "I heart my Willie" with a picture of Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we love Shakespeare, uh, and that was such a great <laughs> interpretation. And I'm yeah. not one for modern interpretations. I'm not. I don't like it. I think the play says it's set in Verona, 17... Th- yeah. Set the play in Verona in, you know... Yeah. It's very easy to mess up a modern interpretation of an ancient play. It is. Yeah. and But when it's done right, oh my god. I even have problems with the Romeo and Juliet uh, with Leonardo DiCaprio. The Baz Luhrmann one? Yeah. yeah. Artistically, visually, oh, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. I just don't no, like... I, I understand the problem, how, too. Yeah, like, for me... I, I felt like they were talking down to me when they said, draw your sword, and it's a gun, and it says sword on it. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, okay, you really don't have to talk down to me yeah. on you this You don't point. have to sell me on that yeah. point. You I know? get it. Draw <laughs> your you weapon. You can be wittier about yeah. that and, you know, have the brand of the gun yeah. be rapier. Yeah. You know, or or broad like sword, or yeah. you can be clever. Oh, man. But it's like, okay, I get it. Not everyone understands. Shakespeare right away. Mm-hmm. But you don't have to talk down. When he says draw your sword, you get it. They're drawing yeah. a weapon. You know? I'm just glad they kept sword instead of gun. I'm glad. I don't like yeah. when they played with the... I, I can accept it on a level that you didn't play with the text. Yeah. Um, you know... I hate it when they play with the text. I hate it. I once did this show 
uh, no, I'm sorry, I once saw this show, it was a murder mystery, I think it was an Agatha Christie murder mystery, oh. and they just, the, the director just kind of injected another detective into it, she just created this role that wasn't there in the original script, and knowing oh, yeah. this, knowing this... It you know, unbalances the yeah, story. it, 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 it does. unbalances the dynamic. You don't even have to tell me what, it didn't add anything, Yeah, cause, because uh, you're taking away from a character. All she did was give this one guy a reason to be put on the stage, and that's that's what she was doing. But because she didn't like actually do it properly, which there's no way to properly do that, but because she didn't do it properly, he ends up standing on the stage for the first half of the play and saying nothing. I thought his character was a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> He's just there, and then he speaks at the very end of the play. And I'm like, okay, so they do see him. There's not interacting with him. What the hell is going on? <laughs> it's just that you've, uh, you've, crea- you've unbalanced <sighs> the story. And that's, it's so easy to take a story and unbalance. It's so easy. Oh, yeah. But once you get that story spinning on, on the right axis, mm-hmm. it's magic. Yeah. It really is. Um, uh, people, people, what, we've been talking a little bit about Agatha Christie. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, starting with Millie, what, who's your favorite, uh, like, in that genre, who's your favorite author? Um, Murder Mystery? Yeah. I would have to say Agatha Christie Agatha because, Christie? I mean, I know there's so many that just, you know, are great at that genre. I'm not, you know, saying it just because I want to say it. I'm saying it because I got to say, I, I love Poirot. Yeah. He is everything that I love about a detective. He's, you know, I love the fact that he's so, like, he's, kind of, he's a dandy. Let's yeah, face it. He's, he's a, a dandy. dandy. <laughs> he, he, he takes such care and pride in his appearance. You know, which is kind of different from what we get used to in America, the hardboiled detective. We're used to seeing the rumbled up pile of clothes kind of oh, yeah, detective. Yeah. Oh, you know? yeah, the, 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 the very the, old coffee gumshoe. Yeah, exactly. The coffee gumshoe, yeah. Uh, what I love, is Maltese Falcon, Sam yeah. Spade. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that is a fictional character in a book series. Sam yeah. Spade wasn't just created mm-hmm. yeah. for that movie. Maltese Falcon, you know, yeah. oh, yeah, and Santa Spade's a great character. Don't get me wrong. I do. I understand why that's such a loved version of the detective. I get it. I love Columbo, and yeah. he's the same kind of police officer detective. He's rumpled. One he's, more thing. Yeah, you know, I, I love him too. You know, but I, I love the fact that there is a detective who's so care like careful about the way his mustache looks. So do this great elaborate thing to trim one hair. You know, and I love the fact that because to me he's everything that I think a detective should be. He's clever he's methodical he thinks everything through and he doesn't just jump on you know the first person who looks suspicious you know yeah, yeah. like you know when everyone else is like oh it's got to be obviously this person who did it for this reason he's like well maybe not you know it could be that person but let us look at all the clues before we jump down this person and, and you and i have said it before without paro you don't get to monk no no because mm-hmm. he you don't get monk without paro because I I know. He's so funny. He's awesome. Um, I love his, you know, you'll thank me later. <laughs> That's my favorite thing to quote from Monk. You'll thank me later. What has anyone ever thanked you later? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but yeah, because Poirot is kind of like an early version of Monk. He's not exactly obsessive compulsive, but, you know, everything is neat and tidy in his world. You know, he's very, oh, no, no, it can't be this person because of this, you know, whatever. And did you not notice that I love how he says the little gray cells are at work, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Just a lot of the little things he says. So, and, you know, without Agatha Christie, we won't have that character. And, yeah, I admit I'm not a huge, huge fan of his, her, her Miss Marple stuff. Mm-hmm. Only because my only problem with the Miss Marple stuff is that it's this little old lady who happens to overhear everything. Yeah. You know, that's my only problem. It's not that... It's great for one or two stories. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the fact that that is her primary detective... <laughs> yeah. Accidental detective skills. Yeah. yeah. It's, don't get me wrong. She's still a good writer. It's just mm-hmm. that I, I think her skills were more honed with Poirot. Yes. You know, as a writer. So, like I said, the, the shows, I'm not just saying I got the Chrissy because we were just talking about her. You know? Yeah. it's I, I legitimately, you know, have favorites of her books and not so favorites. But I still think she is a master at the, you know, br- like we were talking about earlier, bringing it all together. Mm-hmm. Giving the right clues at the right time and kind of, you know, trying to help us figure it out along with the detective. Yeah. You know, yeah. not condescending to the readers, but at the same time, you know, knowing when to hit certain things and, If you, you know, hit that note at the right moment, yeah. you go, oh. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> as a reader, just go. Oh, Brandon really cool. and I have been lo- watching the um, TV, uh, the different the ver- serials, the of, serials Poirot. of Poirot on on Netflix, and um, David Suchet, by the way, is greatest actor. We'll bet each part. other on on who. Yeah, did it. we'll bet each we'll other. We'll put money. We'll be like five bucks at this person. Well, five yeah. bucks at this yeah. person. We'll so, put money down on those it. are the uh, the relatively oldish ones from Acorn Media, right? Yeah. Yes. I love yes. Acorn Media. Oh, oh my God. God. I haven't watched it yet, but they they did the original Life on Mars. Oh. I, I do want to watch it. And I want we watched the American version which lasted one season and they wrapped it up in uh, the original version of Life on Mars went on for three seasons. Okay. Yeah, so nice. the American version just didn't cut it. And it should it was, have. It was a great series up until the last five minutes. Like the last yeah, five like minutes, the last like, five minutes of the last episode, you're like, bullshit! I'm going to stab the director. <laughs> like, we were so into it. We they were pulled like, a Lost on you? <laughs> yeah, they did. They, they did. did. Oh my gosh. Like, no joke. It was a Lost ending. We were quoting it all the time. We we're just like, this is amazing. He has a, a roommate who lives in 2B. Or, no, like, he lives in 2B. She lives in another apartment, and she called. Uh, she called him not, not to. There was a playoff of to be and not to be. Okay. Yeah. And it was just like it, it's been a while since I've seen it, but it was just so clever, and the show should have went on forever. And I don't know how much they stole from the Acorn Media production, but that's that's what we we watch a lot of that Acorn Media and Br- yeah. Slings and Arrows. I actually and, have their. Um, I have Acorn Media's. Uh, uh, the page of their website where you can buy their DVDs. I have it bookmarked. <laughs> and it's not just, like, page one. I have, like, display all bookmarked. So when I go to load that page, it takes, like, a minute because I can see everything. Just like, nice. If you guys ever get the chance, you should check out a series called Rain Shadow that they did. Uh-huh. It's either three or six episodes, but it's, it's, it's not a detective series or anything, but it's basically this deep, wonderful story set in the Australian outback. And it's nice. so wonderful. Oh, God, I love it. I have to check it out. Uh, so, uh, um, Lewis, what's yours? Uh, Christie is definitely up there. Um, the the works in the detective genre that Poe did are up there, too. Um, right now, it's probably going to be a toss-up between uh, the works of Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child and um, Jim Butcher. Uh, I love the Dresden Files, and I also <laughs> love the Pendergast series. They're so... Uh, they're some of my favorites, and they're such... There's such a dichotomy from one another, the two characters. I mean, you have you have uh, Harry Blackstone Copperfield Dresden, who is just this guy's guy. He goes, he starts out solving, you know, murder mysteries and shit, and then of course there's the magic genre thrown in there. Uh, but he's just, he's a, he's a guy. You want to have a beer with him, yeah, yeah. And then you have Agent Pendergast, who is this Southern dandy who is way too smart, <laughs> and. He knows things way before they even happen, and I find that wonderful. <laughs> um, I was going to say Jim Butcher, uh, he wrote a Spider-Man novel. Mm-hmm. Which uh, I've yet to read, but I have to. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I love how he just bends over, grabs a book, and hands it over. Yeah, yeah. just from Hammer Space. Here's the book. <laughs> Here's the, I know. the Darkest Hammer Hour. Space. Um, <laughs> I it, love it. It plays with one of my personal favorite. Yeah, you can tell. Well read. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at the spine. Um, it plays with one of my personal favorite uh, periods in Spider-Man's history, because there's a period in the comic books that no one talks about, where he kind of cheated on Mary Jane. Um, I love how you load your voice for that. Yeah, like, he, there's a period in Spider-Man where he kind of kind of, you, kind of cheats you, on Mary Jane. Okay. <laughs> he, he has this relationship with Mary Jane as Peter Parker. And then he has a married uh, relationship with Black Cat. I understand the Felicia as, Hardy thing. As Spider Man. Yeah. And she's obsessed with Spider Man. And she knows Peter Parker. Um, what kills me in that comic book story is eventually he chose Felicia Hardy, he chose Black Cat. Really? And he took off the mask and she freaked out. Yeah. She goes, No, 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 put it back on! Put it back on! <laughs> Peter can't, uh, Peter can't win. Peter just no, can't win. No. And so, in all honesty, Mary Jane's technically his third choice. Because Gwen, Gwen Stacy... Was number one. Now that you think about it. Yeah, uh, Gwen Stacy dies. Horrible goblin death. Oh, God. Um, that, so sad, by the that way. That scene in the cartoon where he's just screaming, 
He's just screaming. Oh, God. Well, they never, I mean, they switched it, of course, yeah. but the emotion was the same. They never touched on Gwen Stacy yeah. in the cartoon because they knew they'd have to kill her. Yeah. They also never did her dad, either, mm-hmm. um, who died, too. Um, so they, but in the comics, you have Gwen Stacy, who died, and then you have Felicia Hardy, who he chose, and she didn't want him. She rejected him. <laughs> she wow. rejected him. And then years later, she, he marries Mary Jane. Um, the novel takes place after he's married Mary Jane. Oh. And Felicia Hardy comes back and says, I've made a mistake. Wow. Oh, God. Um, and so there's some sexy, flirty stuff going on. And Mary Jane and Felicia have scenes together. It's, <laughs> oh, not, like wow. a, it's not like it's just like, oh, she's the other girl. Uh, no, they get into it. Yeah. Jim Butcher writes that story so beautifully that I'm sitting there reading. The, now, I hadn't read Dresden. I hadn't read anything. That was the first Jim Butcher thing mm-hmm. I've ever read. And what what always kills me is in the dedication or introduction, uh, it says, um, thank you, Stan, Excelsior. Best, mm-hmm. you know. But in the acknowledgments, he acknowledges an um, a editor, and it says, thank you for the opportunity to play in the Marvel Universe. Um, well, somewhere in here, he uh, it it's basically says, like, again, you know. I'm, I've spent years trying to figure out what he did in the Marvel Universe. Like, yeah. what comic did he did he ever write a comic? I don't think he wrote a comic. But, like, what has he done? And he writes Spider-Man so well and so beautifully. No offense, Dan Slott. Um, <laughs> that it, no offense to any comic book writer. Yeah, it, reading, it, it works so beautifully. And he, he it, it's an amazing story. And he finds a way in that story, uh, you haven't read it yet, um, to create, to make the Rhino, one of my favorite villains, sympathetic. Ooh, a sympathetic Rhino. A sympathetic Rhino. To the point to where I've read the novel, and then when you get to the, um, he has a fight with the Rhino um, during the death of Captain America. I'm reading that comic book, and they go at it like mortal enemies. I'm like, that's not the Rhino. <laughs> I'm like, I know what the, you know, like, like Jim Butcher's version of the Rhino is like, they wouldn't fight like that after what they've been through, and uh, it's just, um, you know, it's like I, they didn't acknowledge it as canon, unfortunately. But yeah. it, it, with the new Spider-Man movie coming out, if you want to see or read a really good Rhino story, that is, is really well done. Would you consider this quote unquote expanded universe stuff? I would because the plot actually ties into an actual comic book. Oh, okay. Right. There's a comic book where they introduce this mystical villain who's magic based. It's Jim Butcher, so they touch on magic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they introduce him in this this like six part miniseries. He goes away, never dealt with again. Jim Butcher deals with this character again. Oh, okay. <laughs> and you don't need to have read those comics to understand. Because they tell you everything that happened in the six in the this year, like I dealt with this guy before, you know, kind of thing, mm-hmm. and they give you all the backstory. But since it's tied directly into a comic book continuity, I would say Star Wars expanded universe kind of stuff. Okay. Um. But with with my going back to mystery, I, it's kind of what we've been sticking to tonight. Um. I, I obviously grew up on comics. I read a lot of comics. Um, Would you call them detective comics? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I read a lot of detective comics. <laughs> uh, primarily detective comics. I have two long boxes of detective comics, and I got you know one short box of that other company. Nice. <laughs> that, nice. Other company. <laughs> that other company. Nice. Uh, yeah. Getting around the question there. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but I like. Writers, I gravitate towards comic books. You know, um, Neil Adams, uh, amazing artist, but uh, Danny O'Neill. You know, they wrote some of the best mysteries. And the thing is, uh, I gravitated to more... There's things that you can do in a comic book that you just can't get away with Mm -hmm. in real world. Detective Chip. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, detective, detective. Chip. Oh my gosh! <laughs> There's in it, they'll, they'll never make a detective chimp movie. Which makes me sad um, because after I was introduced to Detective Chimp, I thought he was like one of the greatest characters ever created. Great, great, Detective Chimp. He's smoking cigarettes. He's you know has the the um. I see. Sherlock Holmes hat on. He's a product of the nicotine addiction. Study. He is. <laughs> you know, he's talking back to people. He's got this attitude. He's Detective Chimp. <laughs> you know. You know what? I wouldn't be surprised if they did though one day. I mean, one of the one of the big surprises from the Guardians of the Galaxy reveal was the um, I don't know his name of course but Rocket yeah, uh, yeah. Rocket Raccoon there you go yeah. and you can't do a Guardians of the Galaxy movie without Rocket you mm-hmm. just can't him and Groot you can't yeah. they're the co- they're the comedy um, I the thing is DC the, here's the thing that bugs me about the movies Marvel revels in the fact that they're comic books mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. DC is almost ashamed. Yeah. They want to make Superman gritty. They want to make Batman. You watch the you watch Dark uh, Batman Begins. Mm-hmm. It is almost like a cop movie, with the exception of the guy just wearing a cape. Yeah, yeah. And it plays like that. And you have to do that to get to Dark Knight. Yeah. But Dark Knight Rises should have been the most bombastic. Here's Batman movie ever. Punch him in the face. <laughs> And they never go there. They never give you what you want. Batman Rises is not the Batman film we want. It's the Batman film we deserve for letting Chris Nolan do whatever the fuck he wanted to do with that character. And I say that negatively because he just he was disrespectful to Batman in my opinion. Oh God, I um, have I I have mixed feelings about that. I uh... and this is what what I watched in theaters. I've only ever saw it once in theaters. I will not buy it. I will not watch it again. I am going to buy a three disc. I own whatever, Batman and Robin. <laughs> oh God! Why would uh, you do that on DVD? Why would you do that to the I world? I will not own ba- Dark Knight Rises. See, that's why I love what Chris Nolan did. He took a failed franchise and revived it. I mean, Batman and Batman Forever and Batman and Robin took away the respect that Batman got from the Tim Burton movies and just shat all over it. Here's the thing, though. Batman and Robin's closer to the comics than Dark Knight Rises is. Oh, I know that. I know that. <laughs> and it, it's that's more painful to, the, to say. I know. It's more to the original campy sort of... It's closer to Dick know. Spring and, yeah. you know, Bill Finger era. Um, yeah. And, but I will say for Dark Knight Rises, I loved the guy they got to play Bane. Oh. Tom Hardy. Tom yeah, Hardy. I thought Bane was done really when, well. When, when he broke his back in the fight scene... Mm-hmm. I yelled in the theater, yes! Yeah, yeah, they like did Like, they it. did it! They, they had the it. balls to do it! Yeah, they didn't just put Batman down, they put him down. They put him down. And, you know, in the movie, there was no, um, like, I thought they were going to take the uh, other character and put him in the bat suit for a while. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought, too. Because in the comics, that's what happens. Yeah. John Paul hops in the bat suit to fight mm-hmm. Bane. Yeah. There was no John Paul waiting in the, in the wings. But why I say that movie's disrespectful to the character? Batman became Batman because his parents died. Mm-hmm. He quits being Batman because his girlfriend died. <laughs> yeah, like that well, is just not that, even really his girlfriend at that time. <laughs> yeah, it, just someone he yeah. wanted to date. It, yeah. It's disrespectful to the idea and promise of the character. It, it, it they don't get it. I guess when you look at it from that perspective, mumble mumble. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, so, like, I, I will not watch that. And the DC movies want to go darker. They want to go grim. Mm-hmm. You know, they're looking at the darker titles. They're looking at Justice League Dark, which hopefully they'll crack the code on Constantine. They'll get Dead Man oh, in God. there. Constantine. Um, I love Constantine. I want to see me some Swamp Thing. Oh, yeah. You know, hopefully they'll do that stuff. And those those characters lend themselves to darker treatments. But Superman's got to be lighthearted. Crack a joke, you know? In my mind, and this is coming from someone who's not read a lot of Superman, he should be the, you know, things will work out mm-hmm. all right kind of person. We were watching uh, the Justice League cartoon today, and they it was the episode with Hot Girl coming back and having to put down um, Solomon Grundy. Mm-hmm. And she says, well, when I was kicked out of the Justice League order... 
And they stop her and go, you were never kicked out. And goes, Green Lantern says, I recused myself from the, the vote because of this. He goes, and Superman broke the tie because she never knew the end of the, the vote. Oh, okay. And it pans over to Superman. Superman goes, I believe it give, I believe at second chances. Like, that's Superman. That yeah. is more Superman mm. than Henry Cavill. I believe in second chances. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I believe you got to have at least one major character who's like that. I mean, I get it. You want to, like Brennan said, have the nitty-gritty characters. You know, which is why you've got characters like Batman. Because they, they can be the whole, you know, no, I'm not going to give you a second chance. No, blah, 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 you know. But uh, to me, Superman was always the guy who... You know, no matter how bad things got, he always, you know, tried to remain positive. I mean... He is super. He is a superman. Yeah. He, <laughs> Alan Moore said it best in The Man of Tomorrow. He always knew what to do because he was superman. <laughs> you know, it, it's not just about, you know, him being able to beat down almost anyone and come across, yeah. across. You know, it's not just... You know, this he's the Boy Scout. He's the guy from Kansas. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah, he is. yeah he's yeah. from Krypton. I, I, you, know, you know, but growing up, he was a boy from Kansas. You His know? backstory didn't affect him to the extent that yeah. that uh, Bruce Wayne's affected. Yeah, him. I mean, yeah. Bruce Wayne. His parents, the death of his parents, and everything that affected him deeply, which caused him to become Batman. Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, that that's what drove along him becoming who he was. But Superman, you know, with the destruction of his entire home planet, that did not change the fact that he's still, oh, it, 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 everything will be fine. Yeah, and, and that... It may not be fine now, but it will be. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that happened when he was... A, he didn't even know it was happening. He was a baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, but as far as detective stories, I, um, uh, Sherlock Holmes. Oh, yeah. Great. Those are really great shorts. Um, even now, look at some of those and be like, man, they're, they're ingenious. Yeah. They really are. Um, you know, I, being dyslexic, I, I didn't read as much as, as some of you guys did, so I was, you know, stuck to the comics. Um, but, you know, we could close here, but I, I want to drag out and talk a little bit more about writing. Okay. Um... What are your, Brandon, what are your favorite things, like, stories to write about, you know? I'm grab. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was ingenious. Well, you've been at the table with us. <laughs> um, We're going to take a brief moment no, for a uh, break. Robert, Brandon collects his thoughts. Uh, Robert E. Howard is, is one of my favorite authors because he does the adventure. He does the adventure stuff. And, you know, we go with it. We Conan, Solomon King, Call the Conqueror. Um, we just go with it. We buy it because, mm -hmm. you know, we understand the hero from page one. Yeah. You don't need to read every Conan story to get Conan. Yeah. You don't need to read every Solomon King story to get Solomon King. Which, having just recently started reading Solomon King, I have to say I'm in love with the character. Oh, he's my favorite. <laughs> he's my favorite. There's a, there's a story, uh, Solomon King, um, where this is, to me, the epitome of a hero. He is, you know, Solomon King deals with demons, monsters, all that kind of stuff. It's supernatural horror with him being a, it, it's so great because he's a Christian um, superhero. Oh, okay. Uh, and they don't really touch too much about faith on it. It's just, that's the background. And this is the guy who wrote Conan, coming from the same guy who created basically the atheist superhero. You know, my favorite scene in Conan is the the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. He's getting ready to fight, and he prays for the first time. And he says, if you do not help me, then to hell with you! <laughs> you know, like he's like, he's willing to just forgive, you know, like, he, he, Conan's pretty much an atheist in that way. And so, th this has brought to view, to prove the point that you cannot talk about an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie without impersonating him. Get, get down! Get <laughs> down! I used to see you later! <laughs> um, <laughs> but he... Um, Solomon Cain is the exact opposite. He's a religious character. He's just, you know, he finds strength in God and stuff. But he deals with demons, monsters, werewolves, vampires, so it lends itself to those storytelling. He's walking through the woods, and he's on the path, and he hears rustling 
in the trees, his first thought is like vampire, monster, demon, werewolf, which in like the first two stories have happened. <laughs> you know, like uh, 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 cloud, mystical clouds of g demons and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so in the off the side of the trail, the brushes is a woman who's dying and has been raped. And with her last dying breath, she names her rapist. The story then takes seven years of Solomon Cain because he, he runs to the harbor. He sees the rapist. Um, leave for like you know Italy, like on a ship. On a ship. Okay. He borders a ship, follows it. <laughs> you know he spends seven years, I think it was, it might even be longer, hunting this guy down. I, I believe it was seven to ten years. Seven to ten. There. Yeah. He, you know they they have several meetings here and there, but it's always like the pirate is leaving as Solomon Kane is arriving. Just you know they have a couple of sword fights in the get eye. And finally, it all comes to a head in Africa. They're battling in Africa on a plane. And the moon is shining. And the bad guy goes, Who are you? You know, what have I done to you? And Solomon Cain goes, Me, personally, nothing. But you raped a woman and, you know... That left her for dead. Left her for dead. And the guy goes, What was she to you? I had only just met her that day. <laughs> But that is that is Solomon King. That is the hero. Nice. That is that is what I love about Robert E. Howard is he is this force for good. Well, Conan is a force for himself. Yeah. Solomon King is a force for good to the point to where you know we never talk. It never talks about how much money he spent. <laughs> you know, traveling the world on this chasing, endeavor. <laughs> on this endeavor, never talks about you know. It's just what he had to do. You uh. know. And that's, you know, when I read, when I write Father Mathis, who is my Catholic superhero, yeah. that's what I'm going for. I'm going for the guy who's probably going to get the shit kicked out of him, but he does it because it's the right thing. On the, um, on the Dresden Files TV series, did they ever get into the character of Michael Carpenter, the Christian guy? Um, I don't remember. I don't think so. The, re the reason that I bring it up is that, um... Uh, Harry Dresden doesn't know if he believes in God. He doesn't. He's not particularly religious. But in book three, Death Masks, we are introduced to the character of Michael Carpenter, who is a devout Christian man and quite literally a holy warrior for God. He wields Excalibur, which is no. I would have remembered that in the yeah, series. Yes, yeah. he wields Excalibur, which has been embedded with one of the nails that pierced Jesus. Oh, yeah. He's not. That's the, awesome. Yeah, he's not the main character, of course, because he's not Harry Dresden. But he he's a he's a badass. He needs and, his own book. Yeah. Um. And and the I reason that. the reason that I bring it up is that there's a, a a wonderful dichotomy between Harry and Michael. Harry sees Michael. Not using magic, but he's using faith power. He is doing these supernatural things through God with faith. And Harry kind of just goes, well, I don't really know what you're doing, but clearly you're doing it, so good on you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't explain it's, this, but it works. Yeah, and, and that's, that's what I love about Harry. He's very much like me in that sense. Like, I don't know what this is, but it seems to be something that is quite powerful, so I'm not going to piss you off. Mm. And he just, he just accepts it. I mean, he, he interacts with literal angels in the course of the books. The, he, I remember <laughs> seeing some angels. I remember seeing that in the series. Yeah, he, he sees I angels. have it on DVD, but he doesn't, so long he doesn't really it. know what he believes in, but he can't deny that this winged, powerful creature thing is right in front of him. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, he just kind of rolls with it. I, I like that about him. I loved uh, the series Dresden Files. <laughs> really did. Um, I, eventually I'll start reading the books. So, um, what, what was the question that we turned? Um, oh, what do you like to write? Okay. Yeah, what do you like to yeah. write? Sorry. I didn't think <laughs> what the original question was. I was going to yeah. say, so Lewis. And then I just stared at him like, but, but, I had a question. Um, like, I like to write those kinds of stories. And if you look at Lovecraft, Lovecraft is the same kind of world that Solomon Cain lives in mm -hmm. without a good guy. Ooh. That's what it is. Ooh. <laughs> we, we read Lovecraft all the time here. Will, uh, there's a great podcast, HP Podcraft, where they do these dramatic readings. 
Oh, I didn't know that was a thing. Oh, oh it's it, amazing. It's we turn so the great. lights off and just listen. And <laughs> I know. And, there was and one. then we go to bed immediately. <laughs> <I know. laughs> we immediately go to bed and hide under the covers. And we talk until 1 a.m. until we just can't stay up. <laughs> no, but it's a great thing. And, you know, one of the, like, more most terrifying of them was, was it the Hound? Oh my god, oh, that was so scary. Freaking A. Is basically <laughs> these, these guys. That's all I can say. <laughs> these guys who um, are, they're not really grave robbers, but they kind of, they have these collections of the cult. And they're they're basically one-upping each other. Oh, well you have this? I'm going to go get this. <laughs> and they're one-upping each other and they have this like demonic of like bones and weird things. And eventually they break into a tomb to steal this idol and that's a lot of Lovecraft. There's always these idols that are floating around. Yeah. Which I play with in uh, Betty Bombshell. Nice. Um, so there's always these idols floating around. And they start to hear, like, the these dog sounds, the hounds. And what it eventually is, is like a hound from hell has come after them for the idol. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, uh, the lights went on very quickly after the yeah, story. Yeah, very, yeah. Like I was like, um, I'm not gonna go to bed. I'm not. I'm not that tired. You t- I'm not that tired. Not, let's put on Superman. Yeah. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Superman. Um, I'm but, not doing the story any justice. I'm. Really I know not, it's not. Yeah. It, it doesn't sound. It's not us <laughs> describing it is not nearly as scary as actually when we listen to it. Yeah, but, but it got to the point where I was like, um, I'm not going back to the bedroom until uh, you go with me. Make sure there's no hellhound in there. Yeah. <laughs> Love Lovecraft <laughs> is is the same kind of world as Robert E. Howard, Conan, Saul McCain, without a good guy. Um, that is terrifying. <laughs> but it, it is. When I write horror, that's because those are the things I write. I write horror, or I write, um, you know, adventure, or I'll do like something like um, uh, How to Kill a God, which is fanfic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what it's it is. Basically, that's basically what it is. Like, it, it's me wanting to talk to Superman. And I yeah. know fanfic because I used to, I used to write fanfic. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, and I get more love off of that story than anything. Oh, yeah, God. yeah. Um, well, I mean, it, it worked for um, Fifty Shades of Grey. You Fifty just, Shades of Grey. You just put a post out there and be like, uh, and you'll get a book deal. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, so, but, if you uh, liked Fifty Shades. <laughs> if you like Fifty Shades. Then um, you'll hate this story because it's actually, <laughs> it's actually worth reading. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, Lewis, what, what do you like to write? Uh, I like to write... Uh, either stream of consciousness, which is just sort of like blog material, or essay in a box. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Essay in a matchbox. Um, or I tend to explore sort of the dark and unsettling aspects of human nature, like with um, uh, Darkling Eyes. Mm. With that one, I mean, we have this very flawed, very fragile character who kind of, sort of, you think, maybe kills people. <laughs> yeah, I still don't know what happened. In, like, I'm, I'm reading that, and I illustrated some stuff for it. But You're I, not supposed to know. It's just like, You're not what, supposed to know what's... right away. It's going to be part of a novel. Is oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, huh. it's going to be part of an actual novel, and you'll eventually figure out what's happening, but in that first story, it's intentional that you don't know what's going on, really. Mm. Okay, cool. But, um... I was sitting there thinking, even at, when I was editing it, I'm like, um... What's... What just happened? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm invested in these characters. It's not like it's not like it's poorly written. It's just like, like I'm invested in these characters. I like what's going on, but I don't know. Yeah, you you <laughs> drop someone in the middle of the story, and I'm just thinking like I want to ask Lewis in case I'm missing something, but <laughs> you and I don't. That's, that's just I've noticed that's sort of how I write. I tend to start like more or less in the middle of things and then sometimes end in the middle of things I don't I don't know why I, I have this almost subconscious aversion to the end I just you know I can't I don't want to go like, like <laughs> oh god <laughs> <laughs> oh you're gonna hold can of word right there like I I do have endings every once in a while but usually like I don't you know fiend there is no fiend it's just like Here's what happened. Here's a day in the life of this person who maybe kills people, maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, that one will have an ending eventually, but I'm not okay. there at all. Um, so I know with you, I force you to write stuff. 
Yeah, he do. I look at what people turn into the pulp and I'm like, okay, we don't have this, we don't have that. <laughs> That's know. how I got That's a fairy tale. <laughs> That's how I got forced into the detective one. He's like, no one's written a detective thing. And I'm like, it's a pulp magazine. That's what people expect. <laughs> so I was like, he just looked at me and goes, I need you to write a detective story. I was like, okay. He walks out of the room like, holy crap, what did I just say yes to? <laughs> oh my gosh. I, and then it's like, I don't want to go in, but like, I don't want to do it because I already said I would do it. You know? Yeah, sure, honey. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, like, he purposely does that. I'll do the dishes if you write, <laughs> <laughs> if you write a detective story. <laughs> and then it's like, hmm, something I don't know how to do, something I don't want to do. <laughs> don't know how, don't know, don't want to. Gee, what a conundrum. <laughs> Oh, I like the detective story, but you do the niches first. <laughs> you know what, next, uh, for volume uh, 7 of 8-Bit Pulp, or volume 6. I was going to say, are we on volume 7? Yeah. We're, we're on uh, well, 5. 5, five. five yeah. is coming out in March. Yeah. Oh, future topics. Okay. Future right. topics. What I might do is just take a bunch of categories, put them in a jar, and, and have, have the writers, out. like, yeah. jar of doom, <laughs> this is what you're writing. I love that idea. <laughs> I love it. That's fantastic. Real morality. Turn, turn, turn. <laughs> Show us the lesson that we must, must learn. learn. I uh, think well, I oh think that'll God. probably be issue six right there. <laughs> nice. You know, but um, oh let's see. As far as what I actually like to write, <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I I kind of do what Lewis just said. Like sometimes I like to write real life. You know, like mm-hmm. what a day, a year in the life. You know, kind of thing. Um, so. I'll write, I think, mostly what I, you know, real life, but kind of to an extreme. Like, one of my stories that I'm working on it for a novel is this girl whose parents died, whose, whose grandparent, grandmother died, and she already lost her parents. And so she's kind of alone, but then she finds out she was adopted, you know, the oh, okay. baby. So it's her, you know, finding out about her real family who lives in a different country, in England. And so it's all about that. So it's kind of like real life, but, oh my gosh, I'm adopted, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, so, and then she even struggles. Do I even want to meet them, or do I just want to leave it be, kind of thing. But she kind of goes anyway, because she's only 16, and she's like, well, I have no real means of caring for myself at this point, you know. Drama is people put in heightened situations. Yeah. Comedy is heightened characters put in heightened situations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And see, that's also why I like to add comedy to whatever I'm writing. Like, I like to inject at least some form of humor. You know, whether it's, you know, just pure wit, people being, you know, witty, or whether it's full on comical. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened, you know. Mm-hmm. But I, I definitely like to write whatever I'm writing, no matter what it is, I like to have some kind of humor, some kind of yeah. wit in there. You know, I, I don't do well with straight on drama. I don't do well with straight on just no haha, no comedy, you know. I, I have to have something humorous, at least in the background at all time. Oh, yeah. You know? I think, I think it was uh Josh Sweden actually that said, um, you know, you can make it dark, make it gritty, but for God's sake throw a joke in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. That's that's how I, I Shakespeare, going back to Shakespeare. You know, that's how I, I like to write. I like to add, you know, I mean, even if it's just even if the main character isn't really funny I like to have characters who just release all the tension yeah, yeah. in any situation, you know. Like, you know... The Washes, the Sanders. Yeah, the Washes, you know, the Weasley Twins. I gotta have yeah, something yeah. like that, where yeah. you just got these characters that are just so humorous, and whatever they say, you're just like, that's comic gold. That's comic gold, you know? <laughs> Their job is to defuse. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's like, I, I don't do... If I... Like, I, I think, for me a real, real, real challenge would be to do straight-up drama, no comedy. That would be the, like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do that, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So. Yeah, I... At that point, it's kind of unfun. It's just, yeah, it's just no fun if yeah. there's yeah. no humor. Even if, even if the situation itself is not funny, or inherently funny, you gotta ha- still have those moments where you're just even chuckling to yourself. Yeah. You don't have to be laughing hysterically, yeah. just... Like, <laughs> that was that was really funny, you know, and then move on, you know. Okay. Well, in, uh, we're getting ready to wrap this up. Uh, we're almost at an hour and a half, which is normally what we do. Um, real quick, March 1st, 8-Bit Pulp, Volume 5. And then, I don't know if we're going to do a week later or two weeks. 
Um, we're going to start a Kickstarter for um, Last Templar. Um, which is, it's been appearing in syndicated versions of the 8 bit pulp. It's in syndication. I it's love in it. syndication. <laughs> Yo. Yo. <laughs> Um, oh, it has been five seasons already. And, uh, <laughs> and a movie. And a movie. <laughs> um, but it's it's the last template, and it's uh, I draw it, you write it. I do. Um, let's let's end with that a little bit. Like um, you know, we talked a little bit about religious content earlier. That's kind of what this is. Yeah, I'm specifically writing it from a viewpoint that I don't have, uh, and and I, I find that to be very very fascinating from for a writer you know like i i don't believe what the templar believes but i can put myself in that mindset and it it's freeing in a way like i don't have to have my own personal prejudices there so it's like okay he really would kill somebody in this case for blaspheming yeah <laughs> here's here's a mace to your face <laughs> and i think you know just being able to do that like being mm -hmm. able to like you know put yourself in a situation even if you don't believe what the character believes or necessarily do what the character would do it's kind of free because it allows you to do that mm -hmm. without actually physically you doing it you know oh, yeah. and, it, and it makes you write about things that you wouldn't normally which helps you as a writer mm -hmm. yeah and I know from my perspective is uh, um, I wanted to do something Conan mm -hmm. that, that's kind of how the, our Destiny Comics catalog has been built yeah. Is me going, well, I want to do something like Will Eisner's The Spirit. Yeah, that Flatfoot would... McGee. I want to do something. The only thing that's legitimately like mine is Mr. Cuddles. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I didn't like, well, I want to do a book about a tip. No, like, there's, <laughs> there was nothing for me going, well, I want to do something like that. I want to do but, you know, Last Templar was me wanting to do something violent and, and graphic and, you know, kind of adult. Mm -hmm. I remember you mentioning it to me, what, 2009, 10? It, it, it was one of the first big things we ever did for Destiny Comics. It, well, it hasn't been around that long, has it? Cause, hasn't? No, because... Um, it feels like it has. Uh, uh, I know it's been probably a year and a half or so, because um, I... When we were starting up 8-Bit Pulp, that's when we had, we had talked about The Last Templar prior to that. We had talked about Last Templar before 8-Bit Pulp. Yeah, before. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, 8-Bit Pulp, a year. I mean, man, a year, four volumes. Um, and The Last Templar was just like, oh, well, I'm working on this graphic novel. We can just split it up and put yeah. it in there. Yeah. And then we're going to do this thing that I think is completely mean. But I want to do it. In Volume 5, we're going to give, like, a, a good hunk of, of The Last Templar in there. Like, if you want to finish the story. Oh, shit. <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to find out what happens. You know. Well, guess what? Guess what? <laughs> Pay. Oh, God. That you is cold-blooded. Support this book on Kickstarter. Yeah. Please, please do. Otherwise, <laughs> he could be hanging under that historic <laughs> diamond please forever. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. And if we get enough support on this, I would write more. I, I would I would be very much willing to write more Templar. I have ideas in my head for where I want to take it from here. Uh, but they're not going to come to fruition if if you guys don't read it. <laughs> no. Basically what we're saying is give us your money. Give us your money. <laughs> give us your money. Give you us get your the money. podcast for free. Buy the book. <laughs> Gosh, you cheap bastards. <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? We're indie enough at this point that we can be rude pricks. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, well, there... start being nice once we've come you know, a little bit more well yeah, off. Yeah. Okay. There, there was a, I was listening to a story of Jimmy Pagliotti talking about The Pro, which is an indie book he did about a uh, prostitute superhero. <laughs> um, and Sorry. when they did the trade for printing, they had a close-up of... Uh, the character with a speech bubble and then they would just write the dialogue in the speech bubble as like the signature like you know of the character writing this stuff and you know they called it in 2002 they called it like the comic-con exclusive it was like the hand job edition <laughs> you know and this kid comes up and is like well I, you know i'd like to buy this and jimmy paul i was like no 
Um, not unless your mom signs off on this. Yeah. <laughs> and his mom picks up the book, looks through, and goes, "Oh, he's seen worse." Oh, <laughs> oh, oh shit! Oh. Wow. And so <laughs> his mom is all casual. Like, yeah, oh. uh, his mom's seen worse. <laughs> He's so, both seen worse. Yeah. Jimmy Pagliotti has seen worse. <laughs> yeah, so Jimmy Pagliotti on the cover of the the speech bubble, where he goes, just writes, "I want to fuck your hot mom." <laughs> oh, oh, God. Oh, my God. You want to talk about being indie prick. You know? <laughs> wow. we're, we're tame by comparison, I <laughs> guess. Apparently, we don't have the whole situation down We haven't yeah. scratched the surface yet. No, no. So, I mean, yeah, there, there are, you know, and Jimmy Pagliotti's a great, great guy. I've, I've listened to his podcast a couple of times. Wow. Um, I've met him at a couple of conventions. Really nice guy. But just that story, I want to after your hot mom. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we could be dicks about it. Um, yeah, Last Templar, I don't know exactly what all the, the tiers are going to be yet. I'm working that out, but for a dollar, we're going to sell a PDF of the book. You're going to get, you know, a couple other stuff. We'll probably do some prints. You know, I don't know if I can wrangle someone for a variant cover. Um, but no, this, this book's been in work for a long time. Um... And it's I'm, I'm not opposed to writing personal messages and copies as far as, like, if that's even a possibility for oh, certain is. tiers and things, you know? It is. I'd be happy with that, you know? This has been a labor of love between us for years now. <laughs> that's the problem with indie, is you're working, you're working, you're working. But it's like 8 Bit Paul, we put out, last year we put out, I think, eight books, uh, eight books last year. And maybe a little more considering the, no, we did a little bit more of that, because... We had the novels and the, the novels. women of 8-Bit Paul. Yeah. And Terrifyingly Gruesome. Terrifyingly Gruesome, mm-hmm. Tales of Horror. And the, the Mr. Cuddle Street. Mr. Cuddle. So we put out, last year was the first year of us really putting our foot out. But 8-Bit Paul did four trades. You know, the thing is, there's, the books come out so far from each other. Yeah. It's like, we we spent so much time working on those books. DC throws out 50 books, 52 books a, a month. You know, Marvel puts yeah. out 74 books a month. You know, it's hard to compete with that. You get it lost. Is, yeah. You get lost in the in the the, the wash. Um, but you know, that's you, you just keep fighting. You keep saying, okay, this is why this book matters is because of you know you don't work on something for that long mm-hmm. and it not matter. Yeah. And I think because we all really you know care for the pulp itself, yeah. you know, and the different stories that work. I think because of that, it's been. I won't say it's been easy to do all this stuff, but it's been easy for us to commit to it. You know, it's been easy for all of us to say, okay, you know what? We're not making money really off of it because Mm -hmm. we're not well known. We're very, very indie. Yeah, it's it's been fucking difficult, but we've kept with it. You know, it matters to us. It matters enough to each of us that, you know, through everything that's happened in this last year to each one of us, because all of us have had stuff happen to us, whether it was good or bad, you yeah. know. Well, there's and been marriages, there's been... Babies, babies, you know. Yeah. There's yeah. been, you know, both good things and bad. There's been good things and there's been heartaches. And just yeah. all throughout the year, we've all committed to writing for this pulp, mm-hmm. you know, because it just means that much to us, you know, through all the good and the bad, you know. And even when... You know, some of us might have been just hurting, you know, physically, emotionally, whatever. We've still been like, you know what, here's my contribution to this thing. Here's the story, yeah, here's you the... know. This, this has been the the light that pierces the darkness in some of our lives. Uh, it's just, it, it, it matters that much to us. This, this thing that we're making is that important. Uh, it shows in our work. <laughs> yeah, and, and The Last Templar for me... Um, has been just so much fun to sit there and draw because mm-hmm. it 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 is our Spartacus. It's our adults only yeah. kind of um, sexy raunchy book. Mm-hmm. There's there, there's dangly bits. <laughs> there's dangly bits, and and you know I still need to reletter one page because there was a, a page with dangly bits in it, and I was very proud of how I drew the dangly bits. And we had they a, were stout. <laughs> they were stout. We had a writer on the pulp just be like, "Well, I don't want to have anything to do with the book because of is that what that was? Dingley bits. Oh, okay. And so I put the speech bubble over the dingley bits. And you know, we, I didn't want to lose her as a writer, and she, she's, you know, or as a friend, she's done a lot of good work with us. 
But when the trade comes out, there's dangly bits. Mm-hmm. You know, this is <laughs> this is the unrated director's cut. <laughs> unrated director's cut with dangly bits. <laughs> um, Commentary. Uh, all this is so there. Uh, and we'll, you know, we'll we'll probably make, we'll make it worth the the money, and we'll do mm-hmm. special editions, and you know that kind of stuff. And and it'll be. It, I'm looking forward to it. If if nothing else, we'll have this nice finished trade to show off because mm-hmm. it'll it'll be a long th- it'll be a thick trade, you know. And uh, it, it's been a year coming, and it's violent, it's gory, it's bloody, and it's funny. Yeah, it's been yeah. over a year coming. I started working yeah. on this before it was a pulp thing. <laughs> it was yeah, because it was like halfway into issue two i was like oh I, we can do it that way yeah. and do the tri-, you know so and it's been nice for building steam it really has it has and and i'm looking forward to it and one thing when it's over i'm not going to miss is inking the chain mill yeah because <laughs> instead of like because i you know i I'd, like i said i do the live steel they did dc did a book called um they're still doing it. it's the demon 52 book but it it's takes place in king arthur's court that era okay so instead of modern day demon which they've always done they they're doing a prequel demon um the first page of the first book had this knight bleeding and his chainmail is torn like cloth okay and i'm like chainmail doesn't do that i know i've seen chainmail blow apart it when it breaks, it doesn't leave a, a, a clean cut. No. <laughs> it, there, it blows apart, leaves like a almost like a diamond shaped hole. Yeah. Because you lose more than one ring. Yeah, the rings kind of separate. <laughs> um, and so, like, when doing the t- last Templar, I thought, oh, well, I'm going to draw every single ring oh, of chainmail. Oh, you poor fool. <laughs> As a poor fool. So I'm inking <laughs> hundreds of rings of chainmail. <laughs> And then that's why his shoulders got bigger. And that's why his knees got bigger. <laughs> and he's always bent over. That way I don't have to show how much chain mail. <laughs> he's not just getting ready to football tackle you. It's it's the artist. Oh, that shield got bigger. <laughs> that shield got bigger. <laughs> you know. Oh. <laughs> so I admit it. Um, uh, but uh, one of the things I loved about that book and it's, I look at that page every once in a while, is it was the first time I got to do something Steve Dicko-ish, and by that is when he's traveling through time. Yeah. I did this full-page spread of him falling through, like, a Doctor Strange, Dick, uh, Steve Dicko kind of cosmic thing. I liked how that came out. That and it's nice. one of my favorites. It's, it, 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 it's one of my favorite pages I've ever drawn. Okay, quickly, before we sign off, um, mm-hmm. what are you reading, Brennan? Oh, uh, um, to be honest, I'm not reading a whole lot of anything right now. I have a, a pile of things about a foot tall of <laughs> books to read, mostly comics. Um, but we did pick up a series of novels uh, based off the older Doctors. Ooh, nice. And I have uh, a novel about number six. That I keep eyeballing very strangely. Like, that's the one I'm going to read. <laughs> you know. Because I love me some Colin Baker. Colin he's, my Baker. Fa- he's my favorite doctor. I got a Will Hartnell one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right now I am starting Buffy Season 8, Volume 1. Hmm. Uh, and that's that's it for comics right now. Aside from Leaves on the Wind, which I'm going to pick up maybe tomorrow, hopefully. Hmm. Um, book-wise, I got... Uh, Nika Harper's Echoes of Old Souls. She's a Geek and Sundry vlogger on YouTube. And, oh god, it's so good. Uh, I'm also in some of the Robert B. Parker books, the Spencer series, um, the Alphabet series. I think I just finished uh, C is for Corpse. That's, that's a good one, too. <laughs> that's a great name. Yeah, that's yeah. A great name. The, the author did A is for Alibi, B is for Body, C is for Corpse, D is for Deadbeat. She's going on. <laughs> <laughs> But the funny thing is, she started writing this series in, like, 1984 or 85, and she doesn't write them very quickly. So the last book that came out is still in, like, 1996, 97. Oh. And it came out, like, a year ago. It's great. <laughs> nice. Flashback. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm currently actually reading The Book of Lies. 
Ooh, yeah. which, which I love. <laughs> the cover made me want to read that book. I haven't read it yet, but I want to. Cause it's a really good book because it's so great. It talks about like a secret society, and they draw a connection between Cain and Abel. You know, they written the first murder, the first murder. Yeah. in the you know according to the Old Testament. They draw a connection between that and the murder of Mitchell Siegel. You know Jerry Siegel's father. The creator of Superman. Oh, Superman. oh God! They draw a connection between those two murders. <laughs> at, at first, you're like, how the crap are they gonna do that? <laughs> you know, especially since you know in the book they're like, oh, they never say in the Bible what the weapon was, you know, kind of thing. And mm -hmm. you're just reading it like, wow. As you're reading every chapter, you're like, that could make sense. <laughs> you know that <laughs> that could theoretically make sense. You know. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just reading it, and it's really, I, I like it, and I, I'm i really enjoying it. My only uh, problem is that the chapters are so short. Oh. Like, it's only 300 and something, like, 50 some odd pages. But there's, like, 80 but chapters. There's, like, 80 chapters. It? Yeah, like, there's some that chapters, it's only one page right and back. You oh know, and God. you're just like, okay, uh, you know, like, my only, my only problem with that, really, is the fact that, why not extend that? And the yeah. reason, my only, I think the reason why they do that is because it switches points from yeah. like point in the story, view. points of view all the time. You know? Well, it's like Game Man when I was reading American Gods, I I would spend an hour reading one chapter because mm -hmm. that book was so dense and those chapter breaks were so long. Yeah, and I I love Game Man. Don't get me wrong, but that was just. It was, it was it was hard. Yeah, that, that's the flip side of the chapter. coin. I yeah. mean, you, you could do the short chapters, or you could do the Gay Man or the Anne Rice, where one yeah. chapter is forty pages. Well, like I said, I, I don't mind the short chapters because then it's like, oh, I can stop after two pages and yeah. go do whatever I gotta do. But like I said, at the same time, it's like it's just because they're switching points of view, yeah. and you know, it, it all flows. It's not like you're lost or confused, so you know, okay, we're with this character now, and it makes sense, you know. But, you know, like I said, that's why I'm not sure how I feel about it just yet as far as chapter length goes. But the story, you know, I, I, I like it. I really, I mean, I'm enjoying the book so far, you know. Is it a prequel or a sequel to the Book of Fate at all? I don't know. Because it's the same author and it looks like the same style. I haven't, you know, seen or read the Book of Fate. I haven't either. So I don't know anything about that story. Okay. So This is the first I've heard of the Book of Fate. Um, it was, I think it was one of the ones that... I think it came out before the book of lies, and I think it's what um, brought um, him to the public attention. Because mm -hmm. I remember seeing him on like a new releases shelf at Barnes and Noble, and I'm like, "That's a nice looking cover." Because <laughs> it looks very similar to the book of lies. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I, I haven't heard of the book of fate, so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, kids, uh, you heard it here live from the table with Destiny Comics. The following podcast was. Production by Destiny Comics, sponsored by DestinyComics.wix.com slash comics. Recorded live in Hemet, California. Produced by executive producer Michael Sanders. A special thanks to any and all guests who participated in the previous podcast. This concludes our broadcasting hour. Thank you.